I want to welcome you to our uh, extent of our quality and safety efforts uh, here at APSA to talk about opioid reduction. Uh, the session is, we'll have uh, three speakers and four abstracts presented, and then, uh, however, to begin, we're going to have um, a memorial to celebrate one of our uh, one of our uh, foundational leaders in, uh, in the early part of pediatric surgery, and that's set up as a video, so we'll go ahead and watch that now, and afterwards we'll begin the formal part of our presentation. Robert Allen was born and raised in Tennessee. He attended medical school at the University of Tennessee in Memphis, and he completed his general surgery residency at the Memphis Veterans Administration Hospital. In 1956, he went to Boston to begin his pediatric surgery training under Dr. Robert Gross. Of his time in Boston, he said, the first year was spent assisting the chief and learning how easy it seemed to perform pediatric surgery. Then as a senior resident, he learned just how hard it was to perform pediatric surgery. After completing his training, Dr. Allen returned to Memphis. He joined Dr. Earl Wren at the new Levonor Children's Hospital. Together, they established the Division of Pediatric Surgery. He was very bright, very excellent surgeon, technically. He did all kinds of really hard cases that he wouldn't mind doing things that hadn't been done before. If he thought it was a proper thing to do, but most of the time, everything turned out well. The silo for the gaseous cases was really a uh, big thing because those, those kids died and they started doing the silent thing. I think we had 17 straight to do. Dr. Gross and he were very close. In fact, a lot of people thought Bobby was like Dr. Gross and he was very proud of it. He was very interested in that and very worked in action in all the phases of the years. And they all look like When he was voted president of APSA, he went to a meeting and, and they decided they wanted Bobby to be president of APSA, so they voted for him and he won. He wasn't even expecting that. That wasn't any kind of effectiveness. It was coming on. Well, you'd, see, you'd see Bobby leaving, and he'd be doing a 360 down <laughs> in the, to his home in one of his corvettes. Which, interestingly enough, that's how he got it. What group of patients? You'll free me, some of y'all know. Don't sit there like bones. So isn't it useful for us to reflect on uh, where we've come from in order to get to where we are? Um, I wanted to start this session by uh, giving you a little history of the uh, opioid situation that we've uh, earned and now have to own. And so um, if you'll let me begin here, I'll uh, put on the first slide. We uh, The opioid history is an interesting one. We've been uh, We've been dealing with this in the United States for a couple hundred years now. The, um, we know that each day uh, nearly 100 people will die from opioid overdoses. We're responsible for a significant part of those because of the way we've learned to prescribe over the last 30, 40 years. Um, it's important for us to recognize that uh, while this was a low burning fire for a long time, over the last decade it's heated up quite a bit because of some significant changes in uh, the business model of, uh, of narcotics. Um, in the late 1800s, in 1890, uh, the federal government recognized that opioids were a problem and created legislation for that. Um, most of the opium that came to the United States during that time came from the Far East, and because it was 
brought that way, uh, it, it went through a number of cuts, so there would be, it would be diluted each time. That'll be an important thing to keep in mind in just a minute, we come back to where much of our opium comes from at this point. In the 1980s, uh, the World Health Organization, as well as the Joint Commission on uh, the Accreditation of Hospital and Health Organizations, made the management of pain uh, on a significant quality improvement focus. And, um, and so we began to think differently about how to care for uh, multi-trauma patients or uh, patients with long-standing uh, survivorship issues and, and oncology patients. And as that occurred, uh, we began to think more liberally about how to use narcotics. In the context of this, um, drug companies uh, began to th help us with our narcotic usage by reminding us of a truism that was uh, commonly shared that if you have terrible pain that you can never become addicted because the pain somehow balances that out. And uh, obviously that was, uh, we've learned that that is uh, not a uh, uh, something that we can hang our hat on and we have to move on. Um, what really changed for uh, us in the United States is in highly impoverished areas um, and uh, in uh, a new business model came into play. Instead of getting opium from the Far East, um, people in Central America recognized they could produce this. And, it, and the, the black tar opium, which came from uh, the Central America area, uh, was much, much stronger than the multiple cut opiums that we had used in the past in uh, different parts of our society. And so this black tar opium became very easy to acquire for relatively inexpensive uh, purchases, and it was much, much stronger. And it became very, very popular in areas of the country where people were discouraged and felt that they were had lost their presence in society. One of the challenges that we face is that this crept up on us and we followed the lead of our mentors in the cottage industry that's now become uh, developed quite a bit. And so our trainees often want to uh, please us. And if we're not vigilant about things, uh, we will uh, miss the fact that they are going to send many of our patients home on opioids unless we're very, very prescriptive and thoughtful about this. Uh, in addition, because we're pleasers traditionally, we want our patients to be happy with us. We think that if we don't give them narcotics that they will be sad and give us bad patient satisfaction scores. And these are, uh, these are uh, uh, evidence-based guidelines from the Michigan Open Project that you can reflect on as you look at these slides later on. I wanted to uh, um, uh, conclude this by, uh, uh, Mahul will bug me about this because I'm using a, a lay press uh, novel in, in a scientific meeting, but um, the, uh, these books uh, are very interesting. They give us a history of the, the social science and the challenges that uh, cause the environment that we live in to occur, and they're worth reading even if uh, we shouldn't be quoting them in professional meetings. I wanted to uh, just wrap up my introduction for a second by uh, sharing with you some thoughts about how um, our patients who are often athletes and quite active can end up having an injury. And because we haven't been thoughtful about how we address this, our, uh, our patients may go home on narcotics and, uh, and then find out that, that this is something that they really enjoy. And uh, here, it's very easy to find stories in the lay literature about uh, highly functioning athletes who had an injury and ended up uh, finishing their prescribed narcotics and then went into the community to look for uh, off the street narcotics that had variable strengths and ended up uh, being pulseless and cold when their parents woke them up in the morning. As we go through this next hour, I'd like you to think about a number of questions. This is just an invitation for you to think about what you could do when you went home. Um, many of us don't think about persistent opioid use after a surgical procedure as being an adverse event. We don't measure it 
we often don't uh, look for it. And yet when someone's taking a narcotic six months after a surgical procedure that we performed and we wrote those prescriptions, we may need to begin to think about uh, persistent use as an adverse event. I know that as I went through the, uh, this uh, several years ago for a different reason, I began to ask questions of my patients. Uh, have you had opioids in the last year to determine whether they were uh, opium naive or not? And that helped me to understand how better to uh, address this. And so uh, as you think about these questions, uh, we may find some of those answers in the next few minutes. Um, at this point, we're going to transition. Uh, Dr. Rank uh, Quan Kelly is going to talk to us about the evidence base for opium use. We will go through uh, two abstracts, which will be uh, given by um, Dr. Barsness from uh, Lurie and Calista Harbaugh from University of Michigan. Then Dr. Raval is going to talk to us about uh, more about the use of narcotics and how better to control this. Then we'll have our last two abstracts, and then the question session will be after the fourth abstract is finished. So, uh, Lorraine, would you like to or get us started? Thank you. All right. So, about a year ago, actually, at this meeting, um, the outcomes committee, we had been discussing for a while how we wanted to do a literature review uh, looking at opioid prescribing in children after surgery. And the more we talked, the more it became very evident that we need to do, we needed to do more than a literature review and that we actually needed to move more towards creating guidelines around how physicians, surgeons, and anyone who takes care of a child after surgery, how they should approach thinking about prescribing opioids. Um, so um, Bob Baird was very instrumental in this effort, and he previously had created uh, guidelines for CDH management in Canada. And so uh, we put our heads together, um, and this, one year later, is uh, the culmination of, of that effort. So just as a disclaimer, this particular project was funded by the Southern California CTSI through NCATS and the NIH. So uh, I'm going to first introduce the methodology that we use to create the guidelines. It's called Agree To. Uh, then I'm going to very briefly highlight some of the literature that we reviewed and introduce some of our guideline statements. And I want to emphasize the fact that we screened over 15,000 abstracts and ultimately selected several hundred papers for inclusion in creating these guidelines. So by no means am I going to go through the details of every paper um, that we ended up selecting, um, but I want you to understand that this represents a huge body of knowledge that previously hasn't been synthesized in this way. Um, there's three main subtopics that we wanted to address with our guidelines, the first being opioid use, misuse, abuse, and diversion in the pediatric and adolescent population, the second being non-opioid regimens uh, used for pain management, and then finally, how we should best educate patients and family members about opioid use after surgery. So this is our very good looking team. So in addition to the pediatric surgeons who are part of the outcomes committee, we also had representation from pediatric anesthesiology, pediatric surgical nursing, PACU nursing. Um, we also had a general surgery resident on the team. Um, and very interestingly, we also had uh, an addiction scientist on our team as well. This is someone I work with at USC. He is not a clinician. He purely studies addiction in adolescents and young adults, and he brought an incredible um, breadth of knowledge to our group. And as you can see, um, uh, this group represents institutions uh, widely across the country, and the vast majority of us were already implementing opioid stewardship um, programs within our own institutions. So the methodology that we used is called AGREE2, which stands for Appraisal of Guidelines for Research and Evaluation. Um, the first domain of that is to define the scope and purpose of your guidelines. So these particular guidelines, uh, we wanted them to be applied to uh, children and adolescents, and we specifically excluded uh, the neonatal groups that we often care for within pediatric surgery, because the group felt that that was a very unique population. Um, 
Very important to this methodology is early engagement of stakeholders. All of the people that you saw in that group were engaged a year ago and helped craft the questions that ultimately informed our literature reviews. Um, and then in addition, we also have a parent and patient advocate who reviewed all of the questions that we wanted to use um, to inform our literature reviews and who are also subsequently in the next week going to be reviewing the guideline statements that we, um, that we created. Uh, the rigor of the uh, literature review is based on uh, what we typically do in the outcomes committee. Um, the statements that we created are very short, concise, and clear. And we actually uh, crafted the guidelines in such a way that they could be applicable outside of general pediatric surgery. There's actually a lot of literature coming out of ENT and orthopedic surgery as well. And these guidelines could be applied to those populations as well. And finally, we definitely wanted to minimize any bias in these guidelines creation. So for the past year, the, um, guidelines, the opioid guidelines group has been having monthly phone calls. We've all been doing literature reviews at our individual institutions, coordinating our searches. And on Friday and Saturday, right um, before APSA started, we met in a conference room and we went line by line, word by word, through all of the guideline statements that we wanted to create. And we all um, presented uh, the primary literature that the guidelines um, would be crafted after. Uh, so this was about just about a day and a half, almost two day process of doing this. Um, we graded all of uh, our evidence based on the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, which is um, what we classically use in the outcomes committee. And we use the Poll Everywhere uh, internet interface in order to have real-time uh, voting on individual statements. And if we did not have a consensus of greater than 80%, we would either reword the statement or we wouldn't include it in our final guidelines. So the first question that we wanted to address with our literature review and our guideline statements was what are the risks of opioid use and abuse in the pediatric population? So this is, this is a loaded question. So it was very important to us that we uh, defined our terms very early on. So there is, um, there is a large study um, that the Department of Health and Human Services does every single year called the Household Survey, and we based our definitions of use, misuse, and abuse of opioids based on how they define that in the Household Survey. So this survey um, each year represents they survey about 14,000 adolescents, 12 to 17 each year, and um, those individual adolescents are randomly selected in so that they represent 25 million adolescents in the country. So their definition of use is uh, taking an opioid as prescribed or taking more than is prescribed or using an opioid recreationally. So that's just general opioid use. Misuse is when you take more than is prescribed to you or you use an opioid medication in order to get high or use it recreationally. And abuse is specifically a clinical diagnosis of substance abuse based on DSM-4 criteria. So I think this graph is very informative. They have been doing uh, the household survey since the 60s. Um, and this graph shows historical trends in prescription opioid misuse among youth. And you can see in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and then early 90s, the overall prevalence of opioid misuse in the adolescent population is around 1 to 2 percent. But then you see this exponential increase in the later years of the 90s and in the early 2000s, and that coincides with the pain is the fifth vital sign movement, and also the expanded indications for OxyContin, and also the expanded marketing of OxyContin. Now, as many of you probably appreciate, this, has started, this trend has started to go down. Most recent estimates of overall prevalence of opioid misuse in an adolescent population are around 5%, but it has in no way gone back to the pre-opioid epidemic uh, levels. And then when you're thinking about a young person who is misusing opioids as they progress through high school, the likelihood of them uh, later progressing to a diagnostic criteria of abuse increases. 
And also there's a significant association between opioid misuse and also heroin use in adolescence. And you can see that this exponentially increases uh, through adolescence. And then with young children, as young as 10 to 12 years old, misusing opioids, having the highest likelihood of uh, heroin use. Now something that we were able to do that was really neat is the household survey is actually publicly available de-identified data. You can download the data set and run your own statistics on it. So our addiction scientists downloaded the data set and we specifically wanted to know what percentage of patients are diverting their opioid medication. So diverting means that you receive an opioid prescription and you share it with somebody else or you ask somebody else for an opioid prescription. So in their survey, they asked people who are misusing opioids, you know, where did you get that opioid pill? And you'll see about 25% of them got it from a doctor. These are just young people, teenagers. And you'll see that almost 40% of them got it from a friend or relative. And the way the survey works is that there's branching logic. So if you answer yes, you got it from a friend or relative, the next question is, well, where did that person get it? And, that, and most typically, over 60% of respondents will say, well, they got it from a doctor as well. So really, this highlighted to our group that opioid diversion is a single step from the healthcare provider. And that is very unique to the adolescent population. So the second question we wanted to address with our guidelines was what non-opioid regimens are effective to manage post-operative pain? And we looked at oral, we looked at IV, we also looked at regional um, methods of uh, pain management. I'm not going to review all of the literature because they screened over 7,000 abstracts for this one, um, but in a general sense, Oral and PR regimens either decrease opioid use or they provide equivalent pain control um, for children and adolescents. Um, we reviewed multiple different IV regimens. Surprisingly, there are ones that we weren't um, that we weren't really aware of that they use very liberally in the ENT and orthopedic literature, which potentially could have benefit in our populations as well. And also, we reviewed uh, procedure-specific regional uh, and neuraxial blocks. Now, specifically for this topic, the group really wanted to create a list of specific procedures that would be good candidates for opioid-free post-operative recovery. So this first uh, table shows that. So these are procedures that we found to be moderate to good level uh, evidence uh, that patients undergoing these procedures really don't need an opioid prescription once they go home. Um, now this table lists procedures that we found there was some evidence, but not to the same uh, level of rigor as the previous table, but these patients, patients undergoing these procedures also could be considered for opioid-free recovery. And then the final question um, that we reviewed is what teaching and preparation on opioid use after surgery should be provided to patients and families? This was a really, really tough question for two reasons. The first is there is an entire body of um, opioid education literature that was developed under the pain is the fifth vital sign movement. And so there's a lot of literature on how to convince your patients to take more of their opioid pills. And so we limited this literature search to the past 10 years in an effort to try to minimize um, that particular literature. And then the other thing is just there wasn't a lot of high quality literature um, answering this question. So this is a huge area in which surgeons and researchers can collaborate to really answer this question well. But there was one primary theme that came out from all of the review of um, the literature that we included. And that's family, that is families want education about postoperative pain before surgery. Postoperative pain is one of the primary issues that concerns patients when um, their children or families when their um, children are undergoing uh, an operation. And they would like that information not on the day of surgery, right before surgery. They would like it before they undergo surgery. Parents want to be able to buy Motrin, stock up on Tylenol, get ice packs at home, and be ready when their child comes home from the operating room. So uh, these are our preliminary guideline statements that we generated through this methodology. Uh, statements one through six um, address misuse, abuse, diversion, and chronic use in the pediatric and adolescent population. And in a general sense, we recommend all healthcare providers caring for children 
acknowledge these risks um, when uh, writing opioid prescriptions. Uh, uh, statements 7 through 14 address uh, the specifics of non-opioid regimens and how they can best be used um, to treat pain after surgery. And then these final statements, 15 through 20, address patient family education and then most importantly, uh, disposal. As we found in review of the literature, review of DEA and FDA recommendations, there's um, several conflicting recommendations and so it's important that you have clear instructions uh, for your patients. So in summary, um, we have just completed our in-person meeting. Those are the guideline statements um, that we've generated after engaging stakeholders, generating questions, doing a systematic literature review, and then uh, using a modified Delphi method to do voting in, an, in our in-person meeting. Right now, our guidelines have been forwarded to uh, leadership within AAP and also within AACS. Um, we're also forwarding them to our parent and patient advocates. Um, if you have stopped by the ACS booth, uh, a lot of the literature that informed that education, opioid education handout that they're promoting was from our literature review. And also, if you want to review it further, it's on the uh, APSA app as well, if you want to take a look at it. Uh, and ultimately, we're moving towards uh, writing this up uh, in a paper. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Harbaugh from the University of Michigan will give our next presentation, followed by uh, Dr. Wells from Brown University. Thank you for the opportunity to share our work. This work is funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield. We all recognize the impact that the opioid crisis has had on both adults and children. We also recognize that even prescribed opioids for surgical reasons can still have adverse effects on patients. It's estimated that one in 2,600 kids who get an opioid prescription have an adverse event that requires emergency care or hospitalization. We also recognize that as opioids are more exposed to children and opioids are more available in the home, that opioid overdose deaths have also increased among kids and adolescents. In children, these are accidental ingestions in the home, and in teens, they're intentional misuse for, um, for misuse or self-harm. And lastly, we recognize that one solution to that is to reduce opioid prescribing. But it's hard to change practice. And part of that may be that as surgeons, we intentionally inflict pain on children, and then we have this moral dilemma of what's the right amount to prescribe in order to reduce the amount of risk of pain versus the risk of opioid to your patient, their family, and to society. And it's even harder because we don't have a lot of data to really guide those decisions. There is some data out there in terms of national prescribing rates, but most of these don't include outcomes like analgesia or analgesic use. What they do highlight is that about 50 to 60% of providers prescribe for common procedures like umbilical hernia and appendectomy, but that also means that 40 to 50% of those kids don't get a prescription and may do just fine. Where when we're left with little data, that means we have to make decisions based on the resources at our disposal. Things like anecdote, the patient that calls in in pain versus all the patients that never follow up that did fine, or routine, we do what we always have done. And so to inform those decisions that we make at our hospital, we started a quality improvement project in April of 2018. We involved four surgical subspecialty services, and we've been calling caregivers of children zero to 17 years after seven common operations to ask about caregiver reported outcomes. We also give all patients a pain journal at discharge so that they can record analgesic use. The outcomes that we ask about are things like pain control, analgesic use, opioid storage and disposal. We also collect how much opioid was prescribed, as well as adverse outcomes, like additional prescriptions that are provided after discharge and pain-related ED visits. For this study, we performed descriptive statistics of all outcomes, and then we also compared the patients who did and did not receive an opioid prescription. First, our population. We had 675 eligible patients over this time frame, and 404 responded for a 60% response rate. Our median age was four years and the interquartile range was one to seven years, 73% of them were male. 22% of patients received an opioid prescription and the caregivers reported that 80 to 90% gave a non-opioid to their children for a median of three days after discharge. Next, looking at opioid prescribing. 
Among the patients who received an opioid prescription, our median prescription size was 10 doses. But what you'll note is for that many of the general surgery pediatric procedures, like umbilical hernia and appendectomy, the vast majority of our patients did not receive an opioid prescription. Next, I'll show you caregiver reported opioid use. In the light blue are the patients who took none of their prescribed opioid. In the yellow, the patients took less than half, the pink nearly all, and the red all. I'll highlight a few points. First, among the patients who were prescribed an opioid, the median use was for about two days after surgery. Next, I'll highlight how few patients took all of their prescription. 90% of the patients who received a prescription had leftover after they no longer needed it. And lastly, I'll highlight these four procedures that you see first, umbilical hernia, appendectomy, adenoidectomy, and uh, inguinal hernia. For these procedures, more than 90% of our patients were not prescribed or did not use any of the prescribed opioid. That is the percentage that you see at the bottom of the bars. In terms of outcomes, first we found that our patients overall had very good pain control, very few had poor pain control. Here's where we compared patients who received and did not receive an opioid prescription. What we found is that there was no association of an opioid prescription with pain control, with receiving an opioid prescription after discharge, or with pain-related ED visits. And lastly, this is what happened with the opioids that we sent home with patients. The vast majority were not put in secured locations, and the vast majority of those left over were not disposed. So what do we do with this? What we've found from this is that we think that for, for at least four procedures, for appendectomy, umbilical and inguinal hernia repair, and adenoidectomy, we should not be routinely prescribing opioids, that the right answer is zero. For those other procedures where children may still need a couple of doses at home, we've created institutional recommendations that are age-based for no more than five doses to go home at discharge. This, the guidelines part of it was really the easy part because what our real goal is, is to enhance the recovery of our patients after surgery so that they have excellent pain control or they can, we can facilitate excellent recovery with adequate pain control. We've done this by engaging a large multidisciplinary group at our hospital. And really the focus has been on enhancing education to normalize the discomfort that children may feel after discharge and realize that that is normal. The second is to empower parents to use non-opioid and non-pharmacologic strategies to adjust, address their child's discomfort at home. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present this work and for all of the help of our colleagues. This is just a brief reminder for the judges um, for the abstract scoring to um, keep that in mind as we present some of these abstracts in this afternoon session. Thank you. I'm Hale Wills. I'm presenting in place of Anna uh, Delamar said, my medical student who had a family emergency. Um, we, of course, all know about the narcotic problem in the U.S. Um, I'm just pointing out, essentially, I'm saying narcotics, not just opioids, because I'm going to look at the injury-related um, narcotics that are prescribed. And in our institution, it's not just opioids, but also Valium, often with fractures. And you figure when we send kids home, their pain management transitions from a medical provider to a layperson who has to do all the things a nurse does with minimal training. In a previous study, this is sort of the trend that we saw in the rate at which opioids and uh, benzos are prescribed. But the thing that we found that was interesting is if you look at the zero to five year olds, only half of them actually filled the prescription they were given and that only got as high as 78% for the teenagers. So we, you know, collectively were finding less than two thirds got a prescription, less than two thirds of those filled it. And that led us to say, you know, is this a representation of underutilization of pain therapy for some of those kids? or are we over-prescribing? And if we're over-prescribing, what's happening to those excess doses? So we proposed a prospective study to uh, look at the reasons narcotics were filled, the duration the parents thought the kid actually needed that, and then what they're doing to store and dispose of anything left over. We conducted this at an ACS Level 1 Pediatric Trauma Center. It was a prospective survey of the parents or other caregivers um, of kids who were admitted to the hospital for the injury and then discharged to home. It was conducted in English and it was done in two stages. First with an iPad hand to the patient at discharge to, or the parent to uh, go through demographic information and then seven to ten days later either by email or phone follow-up we did a, a follow-up survey. Um, 114 parents enrolled with a first survey, 70 completed the, the survey and the demographics here are essentially a cross-section of the typical admissions to our trauma center. 
interestingly, we found prescribing went up from 63% to 79%, and the filling rate also went up. So that made it a little difficult going forward to look at perceptions of why people weren't filling the prescriptions. Um, and when we asked why people filled, they said they thought it was going to help the pain. And 75% said they were directly told by their healthcare provider, please go fill this, not a quibbling about fill it if you need it. And then the smaller portion there of requesting the narcotic are the ones where the kid actually asked for it once they got home. And we also had a, um, a place to just sort of fill in free text. And a typical response was, we want it on hand just in case. We only had four people that didn't fill. And they said they didn't fill because they were concerned about adverse effects or addiction. Similar to what we just heard, the majority of kids were done using their narcotic pain medication within 72 hours of discharge. Just over 10% continued to use it in the uh, first four to seven days. And very few continued to have a need for severe uh, pain management after seven days. Interestingly, 10% never even touched the prescription that they filled. The reason that they stopped was, of course, the pain was gone. There were no reports of adverse events. A couple ran out of pain medication. And then when we asked, what are you doing with the medicine that you, that, uh, you brought home, 81% kept it unlocked in the kitchen, either on the counter or in a cabinet, 53% unlocked in the bathroom. The chart here, all those pairs of numbers add up to 100% for the different areas. But surprisingly, a lot of kids are keeping it in their bedroom. We didn't substratify by age for this report. Um, some in the parents' bedroom, and they at least claim to lock them in those places, but then if it's in mom's purse or on the kitchen counter, it's unlocked. As far as whether at seven to 10 days they still had the narcotics sitting around, 84% said yes, and 83%, or I'm sorry, 84% had unused medicine, 83% still had it sitting around, 38% had no intention of disposing of it. When we asked about what they would do for disposal, this essentially matches current recommendations. Take it to the police station, put it down the sink or the toilet, back to a pharmacy, but 5% were planning to just throw the bottle into the trash. For the other, some said back to the doctor, which really isn't legally or technically feasible in our practice environment, and some, their disposal plan apparently was to keep it. When we looked at education, it looks like we're doing very well with verbal and written instruction for when to give, how to give, the correct dosing. But when you look at the education for storage and safety, 40% of people felt they weren't educated at all on safe storage, and 50% said they had no education on proper disposal. So this is limited, of course, by being a convenient sample at a single center with potential for recall bias, and we didn't quantify narcotics, correlate with injury type, or um, assess if there's a perception of risk for keeping medicine. But we can conclude, I think, safely that most injured children are prescribed more than they need of different types of narcotics, and 10% don't even touch what they take home. And only the minority of people are potentially underutilizing narcotics in their children, and for reasons that could be addressed with ed education, such as addiction or perception of adverse effects. And the future directions, of course, is to get some correlation between the proper need for narcotic pain medicine balanced against injury type so we can improve parent education across these domains. Thank you. Great, so two fantastic abstract presentations and we've got two more in just a few moments. We're gonna take a little um, diversion from talking about opioids specifically in terms of the projects and talk about it more from a global perspective. For many of you that were at the quality and safety session that was held yesterday, you heard a little bit about the toolkit that the committee's been working on uh, diligently over the past, uh, over a year. And um, I'm gonna specifically highlight this quality and safety toolkit again, and this time highlight some of the projects that are represented in the toolkit related to opioid stewardship. So. Just quickly um, going through things, we know that quality improvement is really hard. The, the, it's not just the basics of PDSA cycles and the five whys, but really implementation is where we're oftentimes meeting challenges. And um, what we've done through this toolkit is put out there a nice resource for you guys to use when you want to translate the evidence that you're hearing about in sessions like today into your own actual practices. And um, ultimately, 
maybe change the culture of how you're approaching these quality and safety topics, improve outcomes, and improve the value. And there are a lot of challenges with this. Everyone is really busy. Um, we don't all have the, a tremendous amount of resources to dedicate for these efforts. Uh, oftentimes we don't know where to start or we get hung up on an issue and we don't have the mentorship locally that we need. And, um, and we, all, we all know that we have to have the leadership buy-in at our hospitals in order to succeed. And, um, and so ultimately this toolkit provides some of the tools that you may need to overcome these obstacles. So the solution that we've created, the toolkit, has protocols, checklists, order sets, patient education materials, and a bunch of references. These are organized by conditions or topic areas, and um, they're available for free. And I'm going to show you um, a couple of ways to access this toolkit. The basic premise is that you have a project, whether it be opioid stewardship or appendicitis care or enhanced recovery or whatever the, the quality topic may be. You go to this toolkit and then you are able to go back to your individual hospital and take these projects and implement them at your hospital in a more facile way. Uh, there are a few different ways to access the toolkit. I'm going to run through a few of those. The first one is the most straightforward one, which is a Google Drive. Um, this is a QR code that you can have access to. It's also available through our UPUB platform for not a textbook on the free side, meaning you do not have to have a not a textbook subscription in order to get to the QI toolkit that's out there. Um, this is what the screenshot looks like when you visit the Google Drive. As you can see, it's just simply called Quality and Safety Toolkit, and then a list of the various topic areas of interest are, are there. Specifically, opioid reduction, I've highlighted. And when you click into that, you see a screen that looks like this, where you have a couple of files and various um, institutions that have implemented uh, opioid stewardship types of projects, and the resources are in there. For example, what you'll see is a list of all the uh, projects, the contact names, the email addresses for those individuals, and this overall kind of toolkit um, checklist that we have. Inside those different folders from different institutions, you'll see PowerPoint presentations and handouts where folks have done an uh, actual implementation of, of opioid reduction efforts. Um, you may see some best practices, and once again, these may not be the practices that you want to implement at your individual hospitals, but this serves as a resource and a starting point, and you may need to adjust these based on your preferences and practices and things along those lines, but at least it gives you a foundation and a straw man to work from. Um, there are some really detailed inf uh, pieces of information, how order sets were built into electronic health record systems, and so this allows you to have practical tools to work with your IT departments with. Um, this is a, a, a probably from one of Callista's um, uh, folders, but this is uh, some work that's been done for patient education materials that folks are giving to patients and things along that line. You can rebrand this with your hospital's logo and use it, and we're all okay with that. Um, there are actual um, uh, demonstrations of uh, improved uh, opioid prescribing um, and projects that go through more of the PDSA cycle if you want to really get into the granular details, but overall um, there is a tremendous amount of resources out there. Once again, here's some different ways of accessing the toolkit. Um, on our APSA website, if you go to the Practice and Resources tab, uh, and the bottom, bottom part of the resources is the Quality and Safety Toolkit there. Once again, this is yet another way. You just click that link and it'll take you straight to the Google Drive. So we've tried to make it accessible in a couple different ways that are easy to access. Uh, this is a screenshot of the um, uh, UPUB uh, platform. And as you can see, there, this is how you typically would log into um, uh, not a textbook, but in the bottom left, there's a quality improvement tools link. And once again, you do not need a subscription in order to get into this link. This is a public freely accessible part. Uh, once you click that button, um, a various uh, QI toolkit projects are all listed here by uh, the uh, organ system or disease process and opioid stewardships highlighted. Um, when you get into the opioid stewardship, there's once again various breakdowns and very easy to use interface. Uh, this is also available on the, on the app that many of you have downloaded on your phones for, for not a textbook. Um, we do want your content. The way that we built this entire QI toolkit is by a grassroots effort of Quality and Safety Committee members and other folks that we reached out to that we had known had conducted quality improvement projects and implemented these things at their 
individual hospitals. Um, feel free to email me or Lauren Berman, the chair of the Quality and Safety Committee. Um, if we can help put you in contact with the right folks. Um, if you have some exciting things that you're willing to share, we would love for, to be able to have the APSA membership and everyone else in our field be able to use these things and, um, and hopefully not recreate the wheel with every project that we all endeavor to do. And so with that, I'll actually defer our questions because we're running a little bit behind schedule. And, um, and we'll take questions at the end. The next uh, uh, abstract is going to be number 495, uh, Focused Educational Intervention for High-Risk Opioid Prescribing Patterns. Kathy Barson is from Lurie Children's. Thank you, Mahul. So for, um, I'll just quickly acknowledge I do have disclosures, uh, finally. I'm kidding, uh, but they have uh, no basis on what we're talking about today. So I, I think it's really critical that, you know, we're here discussing op opioids, and the point of our data is not is not just how much and when it's appropriate to, to prescribe opioids, but it's really what you prescribe is equally as important when you do feel that opioids are going to be required. The study purpose actually began as just a baseline evaluation of our opioid prescribing practices, more as a quality improvement process, just to understand where we started. But then based on these data, we then, our second portion of the study was to determine if we could change opioid prescribing patterns after a focused educational intervention, specifically after ident identifying some very concerning practices. So it took, went through three different stages, our re retrospective review, our focused education, as well as our final intervention data. So in our retrospective review, so over a two-year period, our pediatric surgeons across all divisions were responsible for 85% of all opioids prescribed across our healthcare system. We were responsible for 70% of the coding prescriptions, 40% of the tramadol prescriptions, and finally 87% of the hydrocodone prescriptions. Now, these were the data that then formed our concern and the need for an intervention in order to address these concerning uh, data. So what we did is we did a focused education intervention at Grand Rounds. We then also followed up with our uh, advanced practice providers. We first assess baseline opioid knowledge through four case studies focusing on tramadol and codeine. And these, we were only evaluating those clinicians who actually have prescribing rights and abilities. Of the tramadol study, 72% of the clinicians incorrectly identified contraindications for use of tramadol, and 44% incorrectly identified contraindications for codeine use. We then went through a specific timeline of all of the FDA data relate and safety warnings related to these. Specifically, the coding box warning that came out in 2013 cautioning against the use. So if, in case you're not aware of FDA, black's, black box warning is the second highest level of warning that the FDA puts out. They then put out just a standard warning about the use of tramadol in children less than 18 years of age in 2015. 2017, they actually got more specific. They actually came out and said that tramadol is contraindicated between the ages of 0 and 12 years of age, period. That means you cannot use it or should not use it. And then a warning against the use of tramadol between 12 and 18 years of age, specifically for tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, for children with any kind of pulmonary comorbidities, and for any children with obesity. Codeine then became contraindicated under age 18 for cough. And then finally, codeine and hydrocodone are contraindicated for cough or cold under the age of 18. So we went through these data. We then assessed the six months prior to these data being presented and the six months post. In the six months pre-intervention, we had over 2,000 patients were prescribed discharge opioid medications in the Department of Surgery. 67% or sorry excuse me 67 prescriptions were within contraindicated groups according to FDA uh, data in the six months post intervention we had a decrease in the overall number of prescriptions and that decrease was about 18 percent and we had only five prescriptions that were within the contraindicated groups representing a 93 percent decrease amongst these contraindicated prescriptions 
So in summary, we had high-risk opioid prescribing that was identified. But again, what we focused on, or what we identified, is that it was encoding and tramadol, and that was the specific focus of our intervention. We did confirm that there was a lack of opioid prescribing knowledge, particularly relevant to these FDA contraindicated medications. And that post-education, we had safer prescribing behaviors related to these medications. Although not the focus of this intervention, we did have a decrease in overall opioid prescribing amongst all surgical providers. Our conclusion is that understanding institutional opioid prescribing patterns is bigger than just who, when, and how much. It should also include what is being prescribed. Thank you. So Dr. Manning Cunningham will give a presentation on how a single intervention may not be sufficient to change physician behavior. After Megan's uh, presentation, we'll invite the presenters to come up. And Tom, if we could have the, the handheld microphone for them after here. the next one. We got, OK, here. great. Yeah. Thanks. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to present. We have nothing to disclose. In the United States, the rate of overdose by opioids has increased by 490% over the last 18 years. Of those that overdose, over 30% are from prescription medications. More than 22,000 children were admitted to the hospital between the years 2000 and 2015 due to opioid exposure, whether it be from accidental intake, intentional overdose, or inappropriate dosing. Studies have shown that prescribing opioids for short-term analgesia increases the risk of chronic opioid use. Yet opioid medications are commonly prescribed after routine pediatric surgery. After previously showing large variations in opioids prescribing among pediatric surgeons at our institution, the objective of this study was to educate the current pediatric surgeons concerning the opioid epidemic and opioid prescribing. We hypothesized that this single educational intervention would reduce the rate of opioid prescribing at discharge after routine pediatric surgery. We performed a retrospective single group pretest post test study looking at children less than 18 years who underwent one of eight pediatric surgical procedures between January and July 2018. Those excluded were more than one, uh, had more than one procedure performed at the time of operation, had a hospital length of stay greater than seven days, and a post-operative length of stay greater than three days, or were prescribed oral morphine. Our educational intervention took place April 27, 2018, during a faculty meeting. A PowerPoint presentation was given to educate on the current opioid epidemic, the opioid prescribing practices of all pediatric surgeons at the institution over the last five years, and alternative analgesia strategies that may be used postoperatively. There were 1,087 children included in this study who were operated on by 18 pediatric surgeons. The median caseload per surgeon was 46 patients over six months. Less than 1% received an opioid prescription after returning home as a result of uncontrolled pain. There were no difference in patient demographics pre or post intervention. The median age was nine years, 58% were male, and the median hospital length of stay was one day. There is also no difference in rate of opioid prescription between intervention periods, with 46% of children receiving an opioid prescription at discharge pre-intervention and 44% receiving an opioid prescription post-intervention. This remained true when analyzing each individual procedure. We, if we take a simple laparoscopic appendectomy as an example, you can see that Surgeon A gave no opioids, that Surgeon A gave no opioid, um, prescriptions, while Surgeon R uh, gave 84% in the pre-intervention period and 96% in the post-intervention period. <laughs> the most common medication prescribed at discharge was hydrocodone, and, and while statistically significant, there were no clinical significant difference in number of doses or morphine milligram equivalents per kilogram prescribed at either time periods. When divided into individual procedures, only those that underwent laparoscopic appendectomy and umbilical hernia repair were prescribed fewer morphine milligram equivalents per kilogram at discharge post-intervention. There are few limitations to our study. Due to Texas state laws, opioids may be a prescribed or written, e-prescribed or written on a specific prescription paper and entered into the electronic medical record manually. 
It is possible that manual entry was not done for all patients. Due to design of the study, we were unable to identify which patients actually filled out their prescription. Only the attending physicians underwent educational inter intervention, however, fellows may also prescribe opiates at discharge. Finally, education through media or other medical sources may serve as confounder as some surgeons may already have changed their practices. In conclusion, a single intervention may not be sufficient to change the prescribing practices of a large group of pediatric surgeons. Further quality improvement interventions are planned towards this effort. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions during our panel discussion. So I'd like to come to the microphone and begin the question and answer period. Uh, I would. I'm Duncan Phillips from Raleigh, North Carolina. So many of us have found that um, surgeon introduced uh, nerve blocks and other types of regional anesthesia can significantly decrease uh, opioid usage post-op. And this would include uh, rectus sheath blocks during laparoscopic appendectomies, intercostal nerve blocks during NUS procedures, even ilioinguinal nerve blocks during inguinal hernia repair. Um, in North Carolina, our um, payers reimburse zero for that, um, whether it be Blue Cross Blue Shield, whether it be North Carolina Medicaid. So surgeons are essentially disincentivizing from stop or disincentivized from stopping and providing regional analgesia. Is there anything APSA or the American College of Surgeons or can any of our professional organizations help us with that? I have a response, but I'd like to ask our uh, esteemed colleagues. I'm curious, are, is the reimbursement specific to the surgeons or is it also true for the anesthesiologist? Because in our system, it's the anesthesiologist doing it and they are reimbursed. But I don't know, is there a difference? Are you doing the blocks or is it a, dist a change? So these are intraoperative blocks that we're doing once the patient is prepped and draped. Yeah. So our anesthesiologist can't really scrub in and do them with us. And so there's a lot of data on rectus sheath blocks during laparoscopic cholecystectomy and during laparoscopic appendectomy. So yeah, if we stopped everything and let an anesthesiologist scrub in, there would be reimbursement. Yeah. So our practice is to have the anesthesiologist do it before scrubbing. So they do ultrasound guided blocks. Um, all of my patients have ultrasound guided blocks done by the anesthesiologist and they are fully reimbursed for, well, fully is relative. They are reimbursed for those procedures. Um, so that's our practice pattern at Lurie Children's is that it's the anesthesiologist, not the surgeons. So similar to Kathy, our practice is the same, but I might, I might ask you to reframe the question for a second. When we get to a place where we begin to use value assessments, then the block that you gave, which is not being reimbursed for, will, will provide greater value because it's going to cost less. It's, there'll be, what, $1,000 less because there's no anesthesia charge for that. And so we are at a place where we're still not being recognized for that, but at some point when, when uh, you know, cost uh, becomes part of the equation, your, your care will be exceptional and, and you'll uh, have some moral reward for that, I guess. But question, John? Uh, actually, it's a comment, Kurt. Uh -huh. um, as we try to tackle this really terrible problem, uh, I, I think we have to uh, remind ourselves to continue to put forth evidence-based solutions. Uh, I have been concerned about uh, the explosion of using gabapentin or gabapentinoids for this kind of uh, solution because there's really a lack of evidence that it works and uh, it, I'm concerned about the safety profile of it. Uh, you had just warned about not using uh, medical scientific uh, stuff, but uh, yesterday in the New York Times there was an article about gabapentin and its lack of efficacy and its concern for safety. Thanks for your comment. Uh, Whit Holcomb from Kansas City. So I really enjoyed this uh, session. I learned a lot. A couple of comments. On the first paper and last paper, 
it seemed like the mean doses, or perhaps even in the first paper was 10 and in the, in the last paper was 12 doses that were prescribed, and it seems to me like that's too much. So even in a study protocol, that's too much. I, I personally, if I give it, give three or four, four or five doses, so it seems like we ought to be at least dropping our doses if anybody's prescribing 10 or 12, because I think that for many of the operations that we're talking about, we really need like a 36-hour period probably uh, at most. The other comment is that at least my perception, perhaps wrong, is that a umbilical hernia repair could be a lot more painful than a lap api or a lap coli or something like that. So I was really uh, interested in the prescribing characteristics for like an umbilical hernia repair because it seems like that could be one of the more painful operations that we do in, in children and send them home. And the final question or comment is, do, do you all, i.e. the panel, have any recommendations for what medicine we should be using, whether it's narcotic or opioid or whatever, we should be using for outpatient procedures and how many doses we should be giving? Because I think that would be a real benefit uh, from this session is, is to come up with uh, some guidelines or at least suggestions on what medicines we should be prescribing. Thank you. Would one of you like to take one of those questions? Why don't we focus on the umbilical hernia question? Who wants to do that? I have a response, but I'd love to hear your response. Okay. Um, so I, I think what, what this really brings to mind is the fact that we actually have no data. I mean, we have perceptions that we think an umbilical hernia would be more painful, whereas something else isn't. And the, the lack of data is the most concerning part of it. And we have to be really careful when we collect these data that we we use accurate balancing measures as we try to reduce our opioids because we we are responsible for these for the children's recovery and for how this works within the home and so as we do this it's not can we get away without any opioids but when we don't use opioids what are the alternatives that we can use and what are those true balancing measures and a balancing measure of return to the ed is not really getting to the to the heart of the matter which is we're sensitive to children's pain sensitive to children's pain doesn't mean that we give opioids sensitive to children's pain means that we are concerned about measuring it at every stage of their recovery including at home and so for us to really move this bar as we try, as we go through quality improvement initiatives as we do all of this it is critical that we get our patient reported outcomes not clinician re recorded outcomes not how was your pain when they come back to clinic but that you actually ask the patients and their parents in their home environment as they're experiencing it and so these are the true balancing measures that we must use. Yes, we absolutely have a responsibility to our patients and to society to get opioids, the excess opioids, out of the home to make sure that any opioids that are not utilized are properly disposed. But at the same time, we, we must continue to be sensitive to children's pain and measure those balancing measures and collect full, comprehensive data. Can I add to that as well? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sure. So, you know, these are all really excellent points. Um, and so from the data we presented, while we don't have day-to-day -day pain control, we tried to capture a summative assessment of the patient's overall pain control, as well as how much they use. So a few points. So one, in terms of the amount prescribed, that was just the patients who got a prescription. The median dose is much closer to zero if you include everybody. But um, what I think is really important is how much they used. And when we estimate the use, because we asked them to estimate how much of your prescription was gone, since that's what they had in front of them. Um, Estimated use was just a handful of doses for a couple of days. It was really used in sort of that breakthrough pain setting. Um, in terms of the pain control, our umbilical hernias, 97% got no opioid prescription at discharge, and they overwhelmingly reported good pain control when we called them at one to three weeks in the home setting. Um, and then the final piece I'll add is, so we also called tonsillectomy. I know there's a lot of data in tonsillectomy. It really is its own sort of breed, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, in this data, we didn't really have enough 
of patients prescribed to be able to tease out the effect of how much we prescribed, but we did that for tonsillectomy, we didn't show it here. The really interesting thing is that prescription size was associated with how much was used. So if you prescribe more, they use more, it does not improve pain control, and it does not change how much non-opioid they use. The only thing that changed pain control was whether or not we told them to take non-opioids first. The interesting thing is that if parents remembered being told to take non-opioids first, they gave less doses of opioid, they gave more non-opioid, and they had better pain control. So in terms of what medications to use, I think it'll be great when the guidelines come out because those are gonna have some really specific recommendations around non-opioids, um, both in and outside of the hospital. But I think that's really sort of our, our opportunity to, to change how we manage pain and how we prescribe opioids is to change how we educate families and really empower them to know that they have all these great tools at home to manage the child's pain even without that opioid prescription. So yeah, it's 20 after the hour. This will be our last question. Okay. Yeah, well, I was just going to say um, I, I really enjoyed the session, but I really think that guidelines slash suggestions are really going to be important for the practicing pediatric surgeon to, to really change practice because, like, like, I don't think I got a very good answer about what prescription we or what should we be giving them. Perhaps there's not enough data, but as soon as the data is available, I think it ought to be disseminated because I think that's what's really going to change practice. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our uh, panelists for an excellent session, and um, I think it's 20 after, so we have to adjourn. Thank you very much. Thank you.